Hello and welcome to Flight Sim Tutorials, a new series where I am going to be showing you guys how to be flying aircraft right from the ground up. We're going to be looking at all the instruments in a cockpit, we're going to be looking at different types of cockpits, we're going to be looking at takeoff rolls, we're going to be looking at straight and level flight, how to correctly trim your aircraft, we're going to be looking at coordinated turns, approaches, circuits, uh, downwind legs, base legs coming into airports, flying patterns, flying transitions, looking at flying flying IFR, VFR, we'll be looking at flying VORs, from VOR to VOR, understanding the navigation, understanding DMEs, understanding things like the ADF and the NDB beacons, we'll be looking at squawk codes, we'll be looking at stalls, we'll be looking at failures on the aircraft, we'll be looking at different types of aircraft, moving on to twin engines, we'll be looking at um, glass cockpits with the Garmin displays, maybe, maybe if we pick up with this, we'll be looking at jetliners, we'll be looking at Boeings, but we're going to be trying to look at it in as much depth as possible as if you're actually learning how to fly a real aircraft out in the real world which is kind of the point of this of course there will be some limits and some limitations as you can imagine so I'm just going to break this down into how it's going to go there's going to be two sides to this there's going to be this video side over here that you're going to be seeing and that's where you're going to be learning all your basics about flying and everything you need to know is going to be in this videos at least for the time being there may be a bunch of videos in the future where it gets very very in-depth that I can't put it all in videos but I'll try and put as much of it as I can what I'm then going to do is I'm going to have my patreon scheme and there is a five dollar reward on that side now that five dollar reward enables access to discord I've already set it up in discord there is a FST channel the flight sim tutorials channel in there in that you guys can talk to me directly ask me any questions you want about the lesson that I just showed or what you want to see you can tell you can ask me what you want to see or if you have a specific question if you're a little bit unsure about what I explained if you want to know a little bit more more on the engineering side I am more than happy to go into that if you want to know more something more in depth on a specific instrument or specific procedure that I couldn't go into in the video or it wasn't necessary in the video and you're just curious about it by all means you can ask me there there will be diagrams there will be presentations as time goes on so you guys are going to be able to enjoy all of these on the patreon with the five dollar reward connecting up to discord that being said do have to make it very very clear that you don't have to support me on patreon to be able to learn how to fly this aircraft you're still going to be able to learn how to fly the patreon is just support for me and extra information for you and you know make a little bit of a nice community out of this the tutorial community the flight sim world tutorial community or whatever we're going to call this now as you may have just heard I said flight sim world now flight sim world is the uh, simulator that I'm going to be using but that doesn't mean that this will not apply to every other simulator. This is going to be universal. You can have this in X-Plane. You can have this in FSX. You can have this in Prepared. Any simulator that gives you an aircraft with what I'm going to be showing you, you can use. That being said, the aircraft of choice. Let's introduce this. This is the Just Flight Piper Arrow 3 available for FSW, FSX, P3D and X-Plane 11. As you can see, it is a very, very nice aircraft. Very well built as well, very well modelled. Quite impressed with it. Uh, if you guys don't have this add-on aircraft, again, don't worry. That's not a problem at all. As long as you can jump into your favourite aircraft and see similar displays to what I'm going to be showing, and there will be similar displays to what I'm going to be showing, you're going to do absolutely fine. There's going to be no issue. So, with that being said, if you guys want, if you're watching this on a mobile phone or a separate device, I recommend that you jump into your favorite aircraft right about now and have a look at what is in front of you. It may be similar to this, it may be exactly the same as this if you've got this aircraft, or if you're looking at the Cherokee, it'd be very, very similar as well. Or if you're looking at a Cessna, it might be slightly different. Nevertheless, it's going to look very, very similar to this. I do suggest that you have a single prop to start with and try and get a nice basic aircraft like this single prop without a glass cockpit so something like this that will be how we start I'm going to get rid of these so we can have a much closer look at what we're going to be looking at in this particular video so we're going to be looking at one two three four five six in this video that's called 
the six pack. That's not something that you have when you do a lot of uh, training, lot of crunches, lot of pull ups, lot of planks. That's not the sort of six pack I'm talking about. And this is also not the sort of type of six pack that comes along from your supermarket when you're trying to have a barbecue or anything. Although, if you do look at it from the top, you can see why it's actually called a six pack because they do look like, you know, a six pack of, of some sort of drink. Um, but this is our six pack, aviation six pack. So, what is on this aviation six pack? Well, we have an airspeed indicator. We have an attitude indicator. No, this does not tell you when the aircraft is being sassy, nor does it tell you when the aircraft is having a bit of a mardi. We have an altimeter. We have a vertical speed indicator. We have a heading indicator, um, or we can call it, some people call it a horizontal situation indicator. And we have a turn coordinator. Those are the six we're going to be focusing on in this episode. We don't have to worry about anything else out here. We're not worrying about this radio system here or this or this. We're not worrying about this. We're not worrying about anything down here and none of those radios, nothing on the radio stack on this side. And like I said, just don't worry about that. Focus on these six in your aircraft as well. Focus on these six. If you're using a Cessna, it should literally be pretty much looking just like this um, this might not be there but I think these eight are going to be in the exact same place and then this might be moved down here or something so just focus on these right in front of you okay brilliant where do we start where do we start um, well I'll tell you what to start with there are two types of indicators here or two types of instruments we have the pitot-static instruments which is one, two, and three. And we have the gyroscopic instru instruments, which is one, two, and three. Of all these instruments, on this aircraft anyway, five of these are actually controlled when the aircraft is on. If the aircraft is switched off, five of these will stop working. The one that remains working, I believe, is the altimeter. That's the only one that remains working all the rest of them will just die that being said let's get on with the first of the pitot-static one so a pitot-static uh, instrument means that it uses the differences in air pressure from a pitot tube that's outside the aircraft which all aircraft have as well as static vents to look at the outside barometric pressure we'll be talking about barometric pressure when i get to this instrument here but when we get to this one we are going to be looking a little bit about temperature so let's start. Let's zoom in on this one so it's nice and easy for you guys to see. I'll zoom out actually to that because it is wobbling around a little bit. But uh, hey, what can you do? It is an aircraft. It is on. Uh, I don't want to really be pulling up too much too much uh, throttle on this to stop the vibration because it, it's going to start burning things out. So here we go. We're starting with the airspeed. Airspeed is measured in knots on an aircraft. That's K-N-O-T-S or K-T-S as the short version of it. One knot is just over one normal mile. A knot is a nautical mile uh, or nautical miles per hour. That's what knot is, otherwise known as nautical miles per hour. That is slightly more than a standard mile or a statute mile, which is, I think it's about 1.1515 statute miles is one nautical mile and that works out to be about 1.8 kilometers or thereabouts uh, because a statute mile is 1.625 uh, kilometers so for those of you guys who want to be converting there's your conversions right there next up we need to look at what what's actually shown it i mean essentially this is a speedometer this airspeed indicator right here is a speedometer We've got this ring over here, which is actually just the numbers. So you can see 40 through 200 knots, or, you know, it'd be about 44 miles per hour through 212 miles per hour or something. However, however you want to put it in other aircraft, it will go up to uh, Mark numbers or something when you look at a jetliner. By the way, jetliners will also have every one of these instruments somewhere on there. It's that important, particularly this one this one 
the turn coordinator this in fact all of these six should be present on a jetliner somewhere or in some fashion what we're going to be focusing on here is the green tape here the yellow tape and the red band as well as this white band here which you might have just missed you might have missed that white band if you weren't looking at it carefully it is quite easy to miss let's start with the green yellow to red at 60 knots on this aircraft your aircraft may be different this aircraft has a green band starting all the way around to about 146 knots that green band is known as the normal operating range the normal operating range is the range in which an aircraft is happy to fly you can do all your normal maneuvers there you can take off in that range you can land in that range you can climb in that range you can descend in that range it's very happy to do that your turning is absolutely fine in that range if you're going through turbulence it's absolutely fine everything is wonderful in this range try and keep an aircraft in this range for this particular aircraft this Piper Arrow I found that I quite like uh, cruising at about 120 125 knots that seems to be quite a nice place for me for cruising of course you could go a little bit faster you could go a little bit slower I descend at 110 knots I climb at 90 knots which incidentally is the best climb speed for this aircraft so you just have to look it up find out a little bit more about your aircraft but whatever you do you try and keep it in this green range that's where the aircraft is happy this yellow range over here is the caution range. This is not where the aircraft cannot go. The aircraft can fly in this range. It's the abnormal operating range. Maybe there's a failure on the aircraft. Maybe you need to get down very, very quickly uh, or you need to get to a destination very, very quickly uh, for some strange reason, a mayday, an engine failure. You need to bring the nose down and get it on a runway so you're going to be picking up speed and then you're going to pull back and slow down massively using you know using the wings using the flaps whatever you're going to use you can go into this range this range is very very I'd, I wouldn't say it's dangerous it's more of a caution zone you want to go into this range in the smoothest of airflow that you can find if you go into this range with a lot of turbulence if you go into this range in very strange weather conditions you will find that it will start straining the aircraft stressing the wings stressing the various components maybe even the engine and you are going to damage the aircraft but like i said you can go in this range just avoid it i would like i heavily recommend that you stay in the green range especially this range around here that's always a nice range to stay in. Uh, oop, that's wobbling a little bit more, isn't it? Hold on. Sure, everything's okay here. Uh, still wobbling a little bit more. We're going to actually zoom out now. Um, see if I can help this a little bit because the aircraft is not meant to be remain running like this for a long time but there we go so that's that bit there the next bit you need to know is the red line that is your VNE that's your never exceed speed VNE do not pass that red line you pass that red line you are doing significant damage to your aircraft you're risking a catastrophic failure on your aircraft things could fall apart things could be extremely damaged therefore resulting in a possible crash or a possible failure of components making it very very difficult to land or making it impossible to land meaning you're going to have to ditch the aircraft or something of that sort you may overstress the airframe you may do a whole bunch of very very significant damage to this aircraft so that is known as the VNE every aircraft has it do not exceed that speed under any circumstances so on this aircraft at uh, 183 knots or thereabouts I think that's 183 knots lastly we can look at this on on the airspeed indicator this here is the flap operating range so if you don't know what flaps are if you're completely new to flight flight sims and flying if you look at a wing like this you can see the shape of the wing now 
that enables airflow to, to pass over and under the wing at various pressures at various speeds giving the lift that an aircraft experiences at any given speed the airflow and any given angle the airflow over the wing will be given by a lift coefficient with that lift coefficient you can see whether the lift is greater or less than the gravity pulling the aircraft down that's how you get lift that's how you fall in and out of the sky you can also end up with stalling if you end up with the pressure gradient being too great and therefore you split the flow at the back the flow actually separates at the back so the air goes over here and goes over here but just does not reattach behind the wing you end up with this area of low pressure that completely stalls the stalls the aircraft stalls the wing the wing can no longer lift the aircraft and you're going to fall out the sky now that happens in various different circumstances mostly you can have that when you're landing or when you pull up too sharply when you're uh, in the air how do you stop that we have these things called flaps you can see them dropping right now that is in maximum flap range and you can see what that's done is that has changed the shape of part of the wing and it's, it's changed the shape of this part of the wing the front the front section of the wing before it becomes narrower this section of the wing has changed the shape of it so what does that do well by changing the shape of the wing what we've done is we're enabling the air to flow around and still have a chance to attach at the back at a slower speed at a slower speed or a higher angle so the airflow comes along here in the lower speed ranges with the normal wing and may start struggling to attach or may start struggling to provide the lift with the different pressure gradients when it comes to flaps by lowering the flaps you've changed the shape of the camber of the wing that's the shape of the wing the angle the mean cord line that goes through the middle of the wing that shape will change the characteristics of said wing and it allows you to maintain lift at a lower speed in a better format so instead of having the nose pitched up really really high you can have the nose pitched down or not you know not pitched up as high maybe only a degree or so and you'll still get that lift which reduces the risk of you stalling the aircraft by separating the flow that's in a nutshell that's how flaps work yes they're a lot more complicated than that but that is how flaps work so inside the aircraft again we have the flap operating range as you can see as I was explaining you can get slower speeds if the clean operating range which is no flaps is 60 knots before you stall the flap operating range is 55 knots however they also have a maximum operating range after which because of the way the flaps are designed and built you're going to start damaging the flaps you're going to start destroying maybe connections you may start bending the flaps you may start pushing too much air too quickly on them and then they're going to strain to try and hold in the position that they're actually designed to be they are temporary devices so you do have a maximum range for them or maximum speed for them which in this aircraft is 104 knots so there we go that's your flap operating range we'll learn more about flaps when we're actually taking off and landing in a later tutorial what else do you need to know on this well I think it's a good time to actually talk a little bit about speeds this here is the indicated airspeed KTS is the actual unit not indicated airspeed is often referred to as KIAS as you can see just here not indicated airspeed so the indicated airspeed is the airspeed that is read directly from this indicator here hence the indicated part what we also have are three other types of airspeed we have calibrated airspeed which we're not going to be worrying about at the moment so let's not let's not worry about that we have ground speed the ground speed is the actual speed of the aircraft in relation to the ground below you 
If you're wondering how this changes, imagine you are... Let's see, what's, what's the best way to go? Yes, you're on a treadmill. Now, when you're out and about running, say you run at five miles per hour, okay? If you set your treadmill to go at five miles per hour and you're running on it, you're doing five miles per hour. That's what you're doing. That is your indicated speed. However, the treadmill is doing five miles per hour back towards you in the opposite direction. Therefore, the five miles per hour you're going forward, indicated, the, and the five miles per hour the treadmill is going backwards, indicated, cancels each other out. Five minus five is zero. Therefore, your ground speed is zero, i.e. you're not moving forward or backwards. You're in one room in one place in your house. That's how it works. Similarly here, you have air. The wind can blow you around. So say you're doing 100 knots and you've got a 10 knot headwind. Headwind is the wind that comes directly towards you. The 10 knot headwind is going to slow you down by 10 knots on your ground speed. So indicated you're doing 100 knots. Your ground speed is 100 minus 10, which is 90 knots. That's your ground speed. The last one we have is true airspeed, which you can actually see here in the white. You may not have this on the aircraft that you're, you're in, but don't worry about it. I'm not going to be using that. True airspeed is the actual speed of your aircraft relative to the surrounding air, not relative to the ground. This is calibrated, correct, for non-standard pressures, which we'll talk about in a bit, and non-standard temperatures. So once you get the non-standard temperature dialed in, which you can see over here, and you get your non-standard pressure dialed in, you can get a true airspeed. That is the actual speed of your aircraft. That's pretty much all you need to know about airspeed. Let's move on from the airspeed to what should we go on to next? Let's go to the altimeter over here. Since we were talking about pressures, uh, we will go over to this altimeter right over here. So the first thing I'm going to show you is how simple an, an altimeter is. This small needle here points in thousands of feet. This large needle here points in one hundreds of feet. So thousands and a hundred. So you can see here that we are at 318 feet or thereabouts. Yeah, let's uh, tune that correctly. 318 feet. Now you may be wondering what this little thing is over here. This is how you calibrate your barometric pressure. Standard barometric pressure as in atmospheric pressure this is, is 29.92 inches of mercury. So you may see this on your aircraft somewhere and you may have heard it if you've ever played flight simulators before and you've not set up any weather and you set up some 80s, you'll often hear them go altimeter to niner, niner two. That is standard pressure. In other formats, it's 14.5 PSI or 1013.2 millibars, which is what it's shown here. So on your aircraft, it may be showing 29.92, it may be showing 14.5 PSI, or it might be showing this, which is 1013.2 millibars. Exactly the same thing. All you need to worry about there is having the right barometric pressure for the weather conditions. So for the atmospheric conditions, you need the right barometric pressure. Otherwise, as you can see, you may get the wrong reading for your altitude and that's not good particularly when landing if you're landing and your aircraft say the the runway is 55 feet and you've got this wrong um, and say we go there and you want to land at 55 feet you think you're at 200 feet you're actually at 300 and something feet so you are a hundred foot over or higher up than you think you are. So therefore, when you think you're at 50 feet and landing on the runway, you're actually 100 foot above the runway. Even worse is this way. You're now 100 foot below where you think you are. You think you're at 400 feet, you're really at 300 feet. When you get to 50 feet, you've already hit the ground. So you need to be very careful with barometric pressures. On top of that, if there is a significant deviation, you'll also end up with being 
X number above or below an assigned altitude by ATC, which can be dangerous because other aircraft may be around that area. So that's what barometric pressure is all about. Whilst we're at it, I might as well tell you what the standard temperature is. Standard temperature is 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. So there you go. Standard temperature, standard pressure. You guys now know that. Now you know how what an airspeed indicator is like. Now you know what an altimeter is like. Next up, let's go down to the loss of the pitot-static instruments, which is the vertical speed indicator. Very, very easy, this one. The VSI measures in 100 feet per minute. Your one might have 1,000 feet per minute. It still does the exact same thing, generally with the same units. 500, 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000 feet ascending and descending. As you're flying through the air, this needle will rise up to let you know that the aircraft is climbing or drop down to let you know that the aircraft is descending. Why is this important, you might be thinking. I mean, surely if I'm pointing the nose upwards, I'm climbing, and if I'm pointing the nose downwards, I'm descending. That's not strictly true. You can be pointing the nose upwards and not climb. This is where we're going to be talking about going in towards stalls. You may not be getting the climb because the flow around the wing is no longer correct, it's no longer able to generate the lift. It's no longer separating or attaching correctly. So you've got to consider that. That's why this is important. You may be pitched up quite a significant amount and not climbing. And if you're in a cloud, you're not going to know. You are not going to know. Time to move on to the remaining three instruments of this tutorial, the gyroscopic instruments. So I'm not going to explain what the gyroscope is and how, how that works. It's a little bit complicated, not a huge amount, but it is a little bit complicated. So I'm not going to worry about that or get you guys to you know panic when looking at all of those things. We're just going to look at this one, the heading indicator to start with. As you can see, it's reading 2.7 at the moment. Now if you look up towards the compass, it's almost the same thing. Almost the same thing. We're 27 here and we're about just maybe 268 over here. So that's not too bad. That's not too bad. So this in it in essence is a compass. However, we have different types of directions. We have magnetic north, which is where the compass is pointing. We have true north. True north is not magnetic north. True north is the north that we think when we think the North Pole. That's true north. Because of the rotation of the Earth and the angle of the orbit of the Earth, you know, the inclination, as well as then comparing that to the actual magnetic field of the Earth, the actual Earth's North Pole and South Pole is not the same as the Earth's magnetic north and magnetic south pole i think at this moment in time the magnetic north is somewhere in in the arctic circle i believe it is in the arctic circle obviously but it's somewhere around was it in greenland or towards canada towards the north northern territories of canada that's where the magnetic north is uh so it's not exactly in the arctic itself it's within the arctic circle but not where the North Pole is, which means that we could change this. If we knew the variation between magnetic and true north, we can adjust it with this knob here to point to whichever north we want. So we can have it, let's say it's going to be true north, we can do that and have it towards true north. Very, very simple. Obviously it's telling me that my heading indicator is set incorrectly and I've set it correctly now by pressing the D key. On top of that, we also have this heading indicator here. Don't worry about this. This will come in handy a little bit later. So we're going to ignore this right now. What all you need to know is that this is telling you where your aircraft is pointing, just like the compass does. It's got a little needle, it's got a nice little aircraft shape. And it tells me here that I am facing due west, 270 degrees. Compass card, circle, angles, 0, 30, 60, all the way through to 360. Interestingly enough, these are also numbers on runways. We'll get to that when we have a look at the runway. Next up, we're going to have a look at this attitude indicator. Like I said, this is not when your aircraft is having a bit of a Mardi. This is telling you what the orientation of the aircraft is. So 
by one glance you can have a look at this instrument and know exactly what your aircraft is doing it's very very important in fact possibly this could be the most important instrument for pilots because you can tell whether your aircraft is climbing descending banking left or banking right with a direct indication here let me explain what this is this here this gray area which might be blue on yours represents the sky this black area here which might be brown on yours represents the ground this crosshair sort of style here this crosshair little doohickey this is a representation of your aircraft this here these markings over here are 10 degrees 20 degrees 30 degrees 60 degrees and 90 degrees left and right so what will happen is when you are turning your aircraft this thing over here will be twisting to tell you where the horizon is in relation to the angle orientation orientation of your aircraft this will rise and lower to tell you where the horizon is in orientation to your aircraft so if that line is below this black line here it's going to go it's going to turn like black and you're going to know that you are descending if it's way up here you're ascending some of them actually have numbers here which will give you a degrees of ascent and descent so you'll know whether you're going 5 10 15 20 25 this is an old aircraft it doesn't have it your aircraft might have that so it gives you all, all angles that's your pitch angle 5 degrees up 10 degrees up 15 degrees up 20 degrees up so on and so forth and down as well so that's your artificial horizon very very important tool it's very very useful and it's quite neat actually how that works and that's about all there is to that Last but not least, before we end this tutorial, we're going to look at the turn coordinator. Turn coordinator is extremely simple, very, very simple, but it does have some very important information that is vital to when you are flying. Let me show you. This here, obviously, you can tell, is an aircraft. That's, that's a given. You can also tell that it's got these markings here, which look like bank angles they are bank angles when you turn your aircraft this will rotate left and right or twist left and right actually the correct word for it is roll left and right to show you where your aircraft is in relation to gravity very very simple that's all it is so what's this down here you might be asking this inclinometer what what is this inclinometer looks like a spirit level for those of you who do DIY at home when you're trying to line up a fridge or a shelf or a cabinet or a cupboard you put this on and it, it moves left and right to tell you whether it's too left or too far right this works in a similar way when you rotate your aircraft when you roll and bank your aircraft you are producing a moment of inertia a, a pivot point about which your aircraft rotates now what happens is that your center of gravity will move if your turn is not coordinated. That's why it's called a turn coordinator. When your center of gravity moves around, it will push this left and right. So the turning forces, the moment, the momentum is going to push this left and right as we go around. If this is too far left and too far right, in fact, if it's anywhere but the middle, you are sliding or slipping or skidding your aircraft. I know what you're thinking. You can't skid an aircraft. You can skid a car. You can't skid an aircraft. You can skid an aircraft and you can slide and you can skip or spin an aircraft. And that's what this prevents. If you keep this in the middle, you keep this in the middle with rudder controls as you're banking your turn, you have a correctly banked turn. A correctly banked turn means that your moment and your center of gravity or your center of mass is matched up therefore you don't have an undue rotation on the back of your aircraft if you have an undue rotation on the back of your aircraft which is why it's the rudder that controls this because the rudder's at the back 
you will start spinning the back of your aircraft sort of like how you spin a, a rear wheel drive car or in fact a car on ice you go around a corner and the front of your car is gripped and you go around the corner and you've put maybe too much power down or you've gone around the corner too fast and the back of the car slides outwards and tries to spin on a car you can't really correct that apart from with the front wheels if you're on ice uh, too too bad if you've got a rear wheel drive car you can try and correct if you've got a front wheel drive car and you've got lift off oversteer as it's called you can try and correct it by turning the wheel in the opposite direction in this it's the rudder because it's at the back not at the front you don't turn it in the opposite direction you turn it in the direction you're turning so if you're banking the air aircraft say to the left you are going to be turning the rudder to the left if you're going to be turning the aeroplane to the right you turn your rudder to the right to give give this correctly banked turn and you monitor this to make sure that you're not sliding your aircraft because you can spin an aircraft out of control and I will be showing that hopefully in one of the later videos I'll do a bit of a spin um, I've actually been in an aircraft doing this uh, I've been in one that spun and I've been taking engineering readings has done that it's quite an experience in real life a spinning aircraft quite an experience but anyway I hope you guys enjoyed that I hope that's a great first tutorial for you guys you've learned about the six pack in the next tutorial we're going to be wandering around this airport over here and we're going to be learning all about taxiways we're going to be learning about the runway which is out there we're going to be learning about all the doohickeys around the airport and we're going to be learning a little bit more about the tower perhaps before we get into actually flying so thank you very much for watching please remember to hit the like button on this video subscribe to the channel thumbs up follow whatever it is if you're watching this on twitch and please do support my patreon scheme link to that is in the description box below your support will be massively massively appreciated like i said everything's being set up on patreon for you guys to have extended tutorials so i do hope you guys sign up for that and you know if a hundred people signed up for it that would be absolutely fantastic and I would be able to make great presentations for you guys it's been a long time since I've done tutorials uh, the presentations will be of university quality as I, I used to write modules and plan modules for university so I know how to write things like that but it's all going to be very simple very easy to use and you guys will be able to just communicate with me a lot better once again thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you guys in the next episode of Flight Sim Tutorials <laughs>